Okay, this is Physics 1A uh, for Section 1620 for Tuesday, March 31st. Um, these are the topics we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the work done by a constant force, the work done by variable forces and springs, uh, kinetic energy, the work kinetic energy theorem, and conservative and non-conservative forces. Uh, in, in short, what we're doing today is work and energy. Those are the main topics that we're going to be discussing today, and that's just kind of a list right there of what, the order in which we're going to be doing so. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Let's talk by let's talk about the work done by a constant force. All right, so what do we mean by the word work? Uh, in physics, this has a specific meaning. In real life, it has another meaning. So, if you, for example, have a job, you have to go to work. That's one usage of the word work. You go to work, right? While you're at your job, you do some kind of work for which you get paid. Now, whether the work you do involves heavy lifting or working at a machine, you probably are doing the physical definition of work. If you're lifting heavy objects, you're doing work by lifting them against gravity. If you're typing on a computer, well, you're pushing against a little spring or something in the keyboard, and you are, in fact, doing work in that sense. Although, I think people would agree that if you have a job that you work outdoors and you do a lot of heavy lifting, that's going to be a lot more you know, work than it is to sit at a desk and maybe write a computer program, which may require more technical skill, but you don't have to exert as much energy, right? As much energy in order to actually complete that job. If you have a job like a construction working job, you're gonna be physically exhausted at the end of the day. Whereas um, if you have a job programming computers, you might be mentally exhausted, but you still might have enough energy, let's say to go to the gym or something like that. So, so the word work, what does it mean in physics? In physics, we mean something very specific. We mean with work, we mean that uh, you have to have uh, a force that's applied through some kind of a distance. We say that that force does, oops, does work. You need to have the combination of a force and a distance. Uh, holding an object in place does no work, but lifting an object upwards does work. Lowering an object to the ground, you're also doing some kind of work uh, in, in that case. So a really simple way in which we can describe this is like, say you've got a surface, right? And I've got a box. Oops. I've got a box on the surface here. Uh, and, you know, maybe we exert a force on this box, right? So let's say that we pull with a force that's parallel to the ground to start with. Uh, and let's say that the box moves from some point here to some point over here, so that now our box uh, is located here. And let's say that that force acts on it for the entire duration, and let's say that uh, the displacement right here we call something like, let's say, delta R. Uh, in that case, the amount of work that's done in this case is very simple. You just take the value of the force and you multiply by the displacement. Really simple force times displacement, and that's going to give you work, and you can see what the units for this are. So the units for work are going to be in joules, and one joule is equal to one force times distance, right? So that's going to be newton times meter. So one joule is equal to one newton meter. Joule after a scientist that first investigated the relationship between heat and uh, mechanical uh, work. So um, what about if the force is not parallel to the displacement. So if instead our force uh, points up at an angle, uh, if instead our force points up at an angle, so our force, if it goes like this, and there's some angle theta right here between the displacement vector and the force, then in general what we would say is that actually the definition of work would be to call that force a vector and say we're going to take the dot product of the force with the displacement here. We've learned that this dot product operation effectively amounts to saying that the, the size of the work done is going to be equal to F times the magnitude of this delta R times the cosine of the angle between them. And that's a more general definition of, of, of what work is. The reason why this works uh, is pretty easy to see if we take our force here and we break it up into components because one component would point in this direction, one component would point in this direction, this side would be the f times the sine of the angle, while this side over here would be f times the cosine of the angle. And it should be pretty clear that the force f sine theta isn't really going to do work on this object because it only has the effect of 
you know, reducing the normal force or something like that. But F cos theta, this piece, this horizontal force right here, is the thing that actually makes the object move, right? It's the thing that pushes the object to the right or pulls the object to the right. It does the work on the object to move it from one location to another location, right? And I've left some details out of this, of course. Like, there'd also have to be some other forces here, right? You'd have to have a normal force. You'd have to have a weight pointing down this way. And you'd also probably have some kind of a friction force pointing this way. Now, this is important because in order to actually do work, you probably have to have some force that you're doing the work against. So this force F will be pulling against the frictional force acting back in the opposite direction. But nonetheless, this gives us a very general way to describe the work that's done by a force. Um, these two things are vectors. Force is a vector and displacement is a vector. But the dot product gives you a scalar. So work is a scalar. It can be positive, negative, or zero. Work is a scalar. It can be positive, negative, or zero. Let's talk about what's positive and what's negative work. So if I have a person, and let's say that this person is going to be lifting a, a barbell. So they take a barbell that starts off uh, down here, let's say. And let's say that they raise it upwards. So they lift it. then the force that this person exerts is up, right? On their hands right here. That would be the direction of the applied force. We'll call it FAPP for applied. And then the displacement of the object also points in the same direction. So this would be, maybe you call it delta Y or something like this, right? In this case, the applied force and delta Y point in the same direction. What does that mean that the angle between these two vectors would be if the force is up? and delta y is pointing in the same direction. What does that tell you about the angle between these two vectors? It's zero, right? So if I did f times delta r cosine of zero, I get a positive number, right? So this corresponds to positive work when you lift an object. However, if I lower an object, so if, if I'm performing some kind of like weightlifting operation and I'm, I'm, I need to now like lower the bar. So if I go from a bar that's raised up to here that I've already lifted up and I've done positive work on it, right? You do positive work on the object, it goes up. Uh, if you now want to lower the bar down to the ground, so what direction is your applied force if you're lowering the bar? Is it downwards? Or is it upwards? If I lower the bar, what direction is the force that I'm applying on the bar? Does it point down like this or does it point up like this? Anyone else think anything different? Not necessarily. You need to hold some kind of a force upwards here in order to actually um, stop it from going downwards, right? But you're thinking the right way by saying gravity. Gravity would naturally cause this object to move down, right? Like gravity would make it go downwards, right? So when I'm lowering an object, gravity is going to pull down on it, right? And I have to pull upwards to stop it from going downwards. Does that make sense? Your applied force on this object is still upwards. even though you apply a force upwards, as long as that applied force, I'll just do it. So if FAPP is less than or equal to the force of gravity, then the object is gonna move down. So it's displacement now, delta Y is down this way. So that when you lower an object, so lowering the bar, the lifter does negative work because FAPP points up, delta Y points down. The angle between the two of them is 180 degrees. Cosine 180 is negative one. So lowering the bar leads to negative work done by you. Does that make sense to you guys? You don't have any questions. So it's different, completely different question to ask would be what about gravity? 
So in this situation here, what's the direction of the force of gravity? It's down, right? So if the force of gravity is down and delta y is up, what kind of work does gravity do? Yeah, in this case, it's gonna be negative. And in this case, the force of gravity is in the same direction, right? So in this case, it's positive. It's kind of an inverse relationship here, right? You do positive work, gravity does negative work. Over here, you do negative work, gravity does positive work. If you think about what that means is that in this situation, in the situation on the right, gravity helps you to lower the object, right? If you let go, gravity would just naturally carry it back down to the ground, right? In this case, over here on the left, you have to do work against gravity. Gravity wants to pull the object down. You need to do positive work to lift it upwards. Because gravity works for you here, you actually do negative work to prevent the object from falling too quickly. Anyway, work, positive, negative, it could be zero. If you just hold the bar in place, you do zero work. Your arms might eventually get tired, but nonetheless, you'd be doing zero like mechanical work, according to our definition of what it is. And that's, in general, what work is. Do you guys have any questions about that so far? Yeah, the idea is just like, if you just hold an object in place, then you have no displacement, right? If delta r is zero, then you just get, you get zero for the work. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't tire your arms out to hold something that's heavy, right? Your, your arms eventually get tired. If this person over here on the right just keeps holding the bar, um, and I guess we can draw a picture of that. If I have a person here and they're they're holding some bar above their head, right? They are eventually going to get tired, right? They will get tired. And they'll get tired because their muscles eventually, you know, they'll be too strained and you just eventually you won't be able to actually hold the bar up anymore. But if you're just holding the bar, this is zero work done by anything really. It's kind of like a balancing, right? The upward force that you're holding it with balances out with the downward force of gravity. But if you don't actually move the object up or down, you're not doing any of the physical definition of work. Now, again, this doesn't mean you won't get tired, but you know, it's technically not work according to the physics definition. There's things happening in your body in terms of your, your muscles and things here and your joints and stuff like that, that can be worn on. But that's really no different than the idea that if I place a very hard load on like, let's say a Lucite table, which are just like those, those tables that have like like folding tables, right? If you put a really heavy load on a table like that, eventually the table might break, right? Suppose that I take just a standard folding table and I load it up with a whole bunch of uh, concrete blocks, right? Just huge. Eventually that table is gonna give way if you put enough weight on it, right? Um, but the table itself wouldn't be doing any work on those blocks. It's basically the same thing. It's just that over time, the things that are holding the table together might give way in the same sense that the longer you hold an object like this, the longer you hold her like uh, heavy weights or something like that, your arms are eventually going to give way and you'll have to take a break. But then, you know, uh, yeah. Does that make sense to you guys? So let's look at a simple example of how we can, how you can use this idea of work, which is this, this example right here. I want to emphasize that in, in what we're talking about here, we're specifically talking about constant forces. We'll talk about what happens with non-constant forces here in a second. So let's read this problem here. A farmer hitches her tractor to a sled loaded with firewood and pulls at a distance of 20 meters along level ground. The total weight of the sled and the load is 14,700 newtons. The tractor exerts a constant 5,000 newton force at an angle of 36.9 degrees above the horizontal. 3,500 Newton friction force opposes the sled's motion. Find the work done by each force acting on the sled and the total work done by all forces. So we're gonna be looking at basically this object right here, the, um, the load, the firewood, 
basically. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to think about what happens with that firewood. So we know that it starts off at some location, and then it moves to another location over here. And the displacement that it undergoes is in this direction. And it has a displacement, I'm just going to call it delta x, that's equal to uh, 20 meters. Acting on this object, there's forces. So we know that it has a weight, um, which is given right here, that points down this way. We'll just call that one mg. This one's 14,700 uh, newtons. There's also a normal force that acts back up this way. There's a force that, for the tractor that points kind of along that line right there that goes this way. I'm going to call that force T. It tells us in the problem that that force is equal to, um, it exerts a constant force of 5,000 newtons. So we're going to say that that's 5,000 newtons. We also know that there's an angle made here, theta. And the angle theta is equal to 36.9 degrees. And then there's a friction force that acts back this way, which we'll just label as little f. And we know that 3,500 newtons is the friction force. Okay. You basically want to find the work done by every one of those forces here. Okay. Let's start off with the work done by the tractor force. Does the problem make sense to everybody? This one's going to be equal to t, the force, times the displacement, which is delta x. And we also need to multiply by the cosine of the angle made between the two of them, which in this case is theta. If we plug in the numbers that we have right here, that's going to be 5,000. I mean, you guys can calculate this if you want to. 5,000 newtons multiplied by delta x, which is 20 meters. And we multiply that one by cosine of the angle, the cosine. That's going to be the work done by the tractor force or the tension on the cable. And if we calculate this out, and we could use so it's 5,000 times 20 times, what is it? Cosine of 36.9. So I think you have to do 36.9 and then click the cosine afterwards. we can just close parentheses and push equal. It's a very long number, but we can just take the first part right here. It's about 80,000 newtons. Sorry, not, not newtons, excuse me. It's newtons times meters, so it's about 80,000 joules. That's the work done by the tractor. Anyone have any questions? Uh, random question, uh, but are the streams recorded? Yes, they're recorded, and they're posted on YouTube. I can repost the link again if you want me to, but it's just Zeke Murdoch on YouTube. I'm reasonably certain there's a message that's pinned in this channel where you can find it. So you know what, I'll just copy paste it right back down here. This is where I post all the videos to. In fact, the lecture that I'm doing tonight, I've already done it uh, on, what was it? Monday, yesterday? It's basically exactly the same lecture. So if you don't have time tonight, you can always come to that time or you can just watch it on your own time. Okay, so the next thing we want to do, so that's the work done by the tension force. Let's now find the work done by the friction force. So the friction force points back to the left, and the work done is going to be force multiplied by displacement again, except now we need to multiply by the cosine of the angle between the force this way and the displacement this way. Since the friction force points to the left and the displacement vector points to the right, right? The angle between these two vectors is going to be 180 degrees. One's to the right, one's to the left. So this is times 180. Now if we plug in the numbers for this one, what was it? Friction was 3,500. Multiply by delta x, which is 20. And then cosine 180 gives us a negative 1. We get that the work done by the friction will be negative. Uh, 20 times 35 is going to be 700. So this will just be 70,000 joules, but it's negative. Does that make sense to everyone? And let me know if you have any questions. I have the second, I have my second screen with the Discord on it so I can see the chat. So any questions you guys want to write in there while I'm talking, I'll look over there from time to time and check them out.
Okay, work done by friction, negative 70,000 joules. We now need to find the work done by the other two forces. And I'll use the space over here in a different color to do that. Um, so let's do the work done by the normal force. I want to mention one other thing here, which is that the work done by friction is pretty much always going to be negative. It's going to be very, very rare cases, which it's not. Um, but this will always be negative. So the work done by the normal force, okay, is going to be the size of the normal force, again, multiplied by the displacement, which was delta x. But now we got to multiply by the angle between delta x, which is to the right, and the normal force, which is up. And it should be pretty easy to see that that angle is going to be a right angle. So you're multiplying by cos 90, and the cosine of 90 is equal to 0. So the work done by the normal force is 0. Similar to the friction force, the normal force will almost never do any work, except for in very specific situations where, yeah, you can generally assume that the normal force is not going to do any work. Okay. Same thing for the work done by the force mg. For the weight, you're going to write mg, you're going to multiply by delta x, and you're going to multiply by the cosine of, I don't know what you want to call it, it's 90 degrees really, so we'll just call it 90. You could call it negative 90 if you want. Um, it's just 90 though. I want it to look that way. Ninety degree, and this is going to be also equal to zero. So the weight not going to do any work. Now this is generally not true. A falling object, the weight does work. Okay, a lifting object, the weight also does work. Okay. Uh, finally, we want to find the work done by each force acting on the sled, and then the total work done by all the forces. That was the last thing that we wanted to do. So to find the total work done by all forces, we just sum everything up, right? We just take the work done by the tension force plus the work done by the friction plus the work done by the normal force plus the work done by the weight. And we're gonna end up getting basically just this minus this, or this plus this, I should say, one's negative. Uh, you're gonna get 10,000 joules. This would be the net work done on the, the this is the network that's done on this guy, right? 10,000 joules. It's positive, which means you're you're continually doing, you're do, over this process, I should say, you've done this much work on the object. You've done 10,000 joules worth of work on the object. What does that mean? What is a joule? I guess the best thing that you can compare a joule to, to compare it to something you've definitely seen before, would be calories. Calories are a measurement of energy. And you can convert a calorie into a joule. Okay. Um, so it's like we're putting energy into the system in the same way as when you eat food, you put energy into your body, right? You consume food, it gives you energy, you can go out and do things. If you don't consume food for a long period of time, you'll be exhausted and you'll have a hard time doing work. For example, you wouldn't want to not eat food and then go run for 15 miles or something like that. That'd be very difficult. You want to make sure you have some food in your system, some energy in your system, some high energy food. Um, anyway, so do you guys have any questions? Do you guys notice any mistakes too? If so, let me so let me know. I mean, the reality is that. Yeah, sometimes they're going to ask you about individual work things. But most of the time, you're just supposed to figure out how you're going to use work to solve them. So this one's very straightforward just to, like, calculate some stuff, but it doesn't... They're usually not this simple. <laughs> That's mostly what I'm saying. This is just an introduction. So we can calculate what work is and then use it a little later, uh, as we'll see in some other problems. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we just talked about the work done by a constant force. So the next thing we want to do is to say, what if the force is changing? This is where this course is going to diverge a little bit from uh, physics uh, 2A or whatever physics you, you've talked about before. This is where we actually do something a little bit different. For variable forces, things get a little more complicated. I need to move both of these guys down a lot. Just move over to the right over here and we'll come back and grab them. Okay, so the next thing to talk about is what if the force changes? The 
there's a lot of scenarios in which force is not constant. Okay. It could be because I don't know you're pulling an object and the rate at which you're driving is changing, or it could be because you're pulling something and you're just pulling harder at one point and not as hard at another point. You could be talking about a spring, which is an object that has a force that's a variable force. Um, so if the force isn't constant and you want to describe the work done, okay, uh, we're going to look at um, this equation that we just wrote down a second ago. Originally, I said that our, our force, we take the dot product of that with our displacement vector, delta r. Okay. But this expression can be further reduced like this. Anytime I take a dot product, it's effectively like doing something like this. If I take the x component of the force times the x component of the displacement plus the y component of the force times the y component of the displacement and so on, for however many spatial dimensions I have, then fx delta x plus fy delta y plus fz delta z is going to give you the work done on the object. Okay. Given that that's the case, we are going to look at a force that only acts in the x dimension, but just change, but changes over time. Uh, so a force that's equal to some f sub x, which in principle is going to be a function of the variable x uh, multiplied by i hat. This is going to be our force. So fx, this means that f sub x is a function of x. fx is a function of the variable x. And then we're going to plot what that looks like. So let's take a coordinate system. Maybe I can use this. That looks like pretty well. So we take a coordinate system. And on this axis up here, we're going to plot f sub x, the x component of f, which is, is the same thing as the force. And then over here, of course, we'll plot x. Okay. And now what we're going to do is say, suppose that our force varies over time. Okay. So suppose that it looks something like this. Suppose that it kind of gradually increases, and then it gets smaller. And then maybe our force goes smaller again, but then it increases again, or something like this. This is our force. Okay. Each moment in time, sorry, not each moment, each position that the object moves along, uh, we sketch out what the force is. And this could really be just as simple as what we just described, right? Like this could be the x direction. And we could have sitting on this thing a box. And the box could be pulled in this direction by an x component of force. It's just the, diff the only difference is that this force is changing over time. So at first you pull with some force, and I'll use the you pull with the force that has some value down here, and then you increase the force. You're pulling a little harder, but then you get it. You kind of you increase it a little bit more, but then you decrease the force, and then you increase the force. It's just like you're pulling on it at 10 newtons, and then you increase it to 20, and then you reduce it to 5, and you're just changing the force in some way. And we've now plotted out exactly how you've changed that force. And the question would now become, how do we find the work done in this case? Okay, what is the work done by this force that varies as a function of x? Does the setup for that make sense to you guys before we go into the details of this? So how do we do this? Um, the idea would be that over very small intervals on our graph right here, the force could be thought to be roughly constant, maybe over a very small interval like this right here. And if we can say that, then what we can do is we can make a box here um, and we can say, OK, well, that's our curve. And if I draw a, a line down like this and a line over like this, I can say that the value of my force at this location, let's say we just call it f sub 1. And let's say that this displacement down here we call delta x sub 1. And then we come over to another point right here, and we do the same thing. We drop a line like this. We drop a line like this. We drop a line like that. And we just keep doing this at every point on our graph. This is probably going to start looking like something you've done in your calculus class before make little boxes at every single point, right? And we just continue this process for every point on our graph over here where the boxes get a little bit smaller. And we try to make it so that the difference on the bottom is basically constant, right? We do this for every single point on our graph. Okay, I can probably start there. And we label every one of these. So this one's going to be delta x2, delta x3, and it starts to get kind of hard to draw this. So maybe this is going to be delta x4. Delta x5, 
This is basically the, uh, this distance is delta x5. This distance is delta x1. And we just label the forces too. So this would be the third one, right? So this is F3. And this was the fourth one. So this is F4. It's just the value of the force at that location. Then I would say that the work done, if we can consider the force to be roughly constant over an interval like from here to here, or an interval from here to here, if we can say that the force is roughly constant, then our force is basically just going to be something like F1 times delta X1 plus F2 times delta X2 plus you keep going, right? And you can write down a summation form for this, right? If we sum over uh, F sub I delta X sub I from I equal to one up to N, that this expression should give us the, the work done on this case. But another thing you might know is that uh, if we make um, if we make it so that the uh, delta x i becomes extremely small, meaning that we make it so that the size of these little boxes down here at the bottom ends up being, you know, effectively um, well very small, then we can replace delta x i with just dx, and the work will then become an integral of just the force f sub x dx and that is our most general not the most general but this is one of the more general um, versions of what the work done would be and if i really want to expand this out although now we start to get into a problem where this might be some stuff you don't really understand super well if i want to um, fully describe what the work done on the object is that's what i need to do so what I derived is the force done by, this would be for a force that only acts in the x direction, but in general, this is the more general version of it. And we can stop and talk about it for a second. In calculus, you probably saw something like this when you were first talking about integrals. And the method by which we're doing what we're trying to do here is uh, called a Riemann sum. And the way that it works effectively is that if you look at what each one of these boxes represents, like F1 times delta X1, if you think about what that is, it's basically just it's just the area right of this little this little piece right here the area of that is what f1 times delta x1 represents right it's it's the area of that box right the height is f1 and the width is delta x1 so that's the area of the box and when i sum up all of these i'm basically finding effectively the area of all these boxes which is a rough approximation of the area under the curve. So effectively, that's what the work is. It's the area under this curve. But in calculus, that's also known as the integral, right? It's one of the things you solve in calculus is how you find the area under a curve that uh, doesn't look like a triangle where it's easy. You know, the area of a triangle is one half base times height. What's the area of the area under a parabola? A little more complicated, right? And that's what the integral does for you. So. The one on the left is, is somewhat easy to understand, I hope. The one on the right, this is something that we refer to in physics, or not in physics, but in mathematics, they call this a line integral. And if you've taken enough mathematics, you probably at some point in time, you did problems with line integrals and they very likely um, used work as an application of that. So you may have even seen this in your calculus course if you've gone far enough. Now, I don't think you do that until like what, Calc 3 maybe or something like that. So if you haven't seen this, don't worry about it. We're just introducing the idea here and you're not gonna see a whole lot of problems that actually use something that's complicated. You will see problems that use this because certainly by the end of this course, you will have encountered your uh, integrals in your, in your math class. But uh, that's how we find the work done by a variable force. And we'll look at an example of it, which is the spring force here in a second. Do you guys have any questions? a lot of math we just did so if you're just confused i understand this is the theory behind what we use to solve the problems but you don't necessarily have to understand every aspect of the theory to solve the problems so. nonetheless if you do have a question please ask So in that case, 
let's take this equation. And let's apply it to a screen. So in physics, the way we treat springs are we say a spring looks something like this. And let's say to this spring we attach some kind of a mass. This guy. So the spring is attached to the mass. And the spring could be, you know, something like a trampoline spring or a spring inside of a pop gun, whatever. Um, and for this mass right here, uh, let's say that we stretch the mass by applying a force in this direction here. So we apply a force here, and we're also going to label one other thing here, which is I'm going to say that uh, this position right here, we're going to call x equal to 0. That is often referred to as the equilibrium position for the spring. This is the point where the spring is doing nothing. So equilibrium position of the spring. It's also known as the unstretched or uncompressed spring length. Okay, We call that x equal to 0 right there. So then we think about what happens if we stretch our spring to the right. So now we stretch it so that the thing is stretched out kind of like this. And maybe we stretch it over to some position here. Okay, Where now it has a new x-coordinate. So this was x equal to 0 then this position right here, we're just going to call x. That's its x-coordinate. Okay. What's going to happen now is, if I want to actually hold the spring in this location, it's going to take quite a bit of force, more force than it initially required to start pulling it. And if I pull it in such a way that the spring is exactly pointing back the opposite direction, then the force of the spring uh, could be thought of as pointing back this way. The spring force would point kind of like back like that. And it turns out that the size of the spring force is given by an expression known as Hooke's Law, and it's equal to negative k multiplied by x, where k is what's known as the spring constant. The symbol k is called the spring constant, and it tells you how stiff the spring is. Uh, a very stiff spring is a string that... Um, what was I even writing. Spring constant. Okay. Spring constant. Um, the units for this are in newtons per meter. So as an example, um, you might have a spring that has a constant that's like, let's say, something simple like 10 newtons per meter. Okay. If you took physics 2A at this school, you probably did a lab where you used a spring that had exactly the spring constant of 10 newtons per meter. What does this mean? This means that it takes 10 newtons to stretch the spring by a meter. It takes 20 newtons to stretch the spring by two meters. And that's seen by, you know, this equation right here. That the spring force is equal to negative k times x. And the negative sign means that it's opposite to the x. So if x is this way, the spring force is to the left. But if you compress the spring, so if I took the spring and I pushed it that way, then the spring force would point towards me, or towards the right. So that's the spring force. And we can talk about the work that's done by a spring, right, by taking this force and putting it directly into that equation for f sub x. So let's see what happens if we do that. So if we take, if we say the work done by the spring should be equal to the integral of fs dx. And let's say we do this. We, we move from an initial position x1 here that's equal to 0 to, an, to a second position x2 that we just call, um, I don't know, we'll call it x prime or something like that. Well, even better, let's just call it x2. Okay, so let's call this position right here. Let's call this position x sub 2. All right, and we say the initial position x1 is equal to 0. Then our limits on this equation here are going to be 
from our initial x1 up to x2. I don't know why the x is off there. So this is going to be equal to the integral. f sub s is negative kx. And we need to integrate from x1 up to x2. For us, this is going to be x1 equal to 0, and x2 is just going to be x2. Okay, So we'll make this one 0 to start with. Then the work done by the spring, the integral here is going to be negative kx squared divided by 2. If you don't know how to do that, all you have to do is you have this is x to the 1. You add 1 to the power, and then you divide by the new power. That's it. So if it was x squared, it would be x cubed over 3. If it was x to the 4th, it would be x to the 5 over 5. You add 1 to the power, and then divide by the power. If you haven't learned that in calculus yet, that's okay. Um, the second piece of what we need to do with this is we need to plug in the limits. The limits in this case are from 0 up to x2. right? So this is going to end up being equal to negative 1 half k times x2 squared. That would be the work done by the spring, and it's negative. Why is it negative? Can anyone tell me? Why is it negative? Yeah, pretty much. It's also opposite to the displacement, right? We moved to the right, but the spring force is to the left. That's kind of the idea. All right. Now, we can, we can write down an answer for what this would look like more generally if we simply replace this right here. So if we went to, to between two arbitrary positions and we said the work done by the spring between two points two arbitrary positions, so we don't care about x, what the values are, we just want to get a general expression, then this is what we would get. We would get negative 1 half k times x2 squared minus x1 squared. And that's going to give us, and there's a negative sign out here too, that's going to give us our most general version of the work done by a spring as an object moves between two points. We can say some things about what happens with this expression here too. Specifically, we can say if x2 is greater than x1, just like in our scenario that we showed right here, what does that mean about the sign of the work? The work done by the spring, is it positive or is it negative? If x2 is greater than x1, what happens to the work done by the spring? Is it positive or is it negative? Mm -hmm. And the other possibility would be if x2 is less than x1, now the work done by the spring is going to be positive. sense to you guys? That equation is going to be pretty useful for us. We'll use it a little bit here to solve a problem. You guys have any questions? Why is Steam loading? I didn't push that. Oh, I thought I pushed it with my... Sorry about that. Alright. So, what's next? Now what we can do we're going to hold this in our pockets. We're going to do a problem with it in a second, except in, before we can really do much with all this stuff, I also need to introduce how velocity uh, falls into this picture right here. And that's through an idea that we call kinetic energy. This is often referred to as the energy of motion. Any moving object has this type of energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So the way we're going to think about this is we start from our equation for work. Hmm. 
don't know why I'm having such a hard time selecting this pen today. I must be, I must have clicked something or done something that caused it to want to interact this way. Huh. Can I just, so when I move to the mouse, I can go and click like this. Okay, I don't know what's going on there, but can I fix this now? Huh, what the, what is this doing? I'm sorry, guys. Watch an old person fuddle with technology. I'm sure it's quite funny. What is, okay. It seems to be working now. I don't know what's going on. All right, so I think it's these buttons on the side. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start from the fact that the work done by a force, any general force, can be described as if I take the x component of the force, dx. So again, we're gonna look at a force that really only acts in one dimension. So our force in this case is again gonna be some function of x to be a function of time times i hat. Uh, so that our work done is going to look like that. But what we're going to do is we're also going to say that if this is the only force acting on it, if f sub x is the only force acting on the object, that force should also be equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. Which means that we can rewrite this equation as the integral of the mass of the object times acceleration dx. The next thing we can do is we can state that the x acceleration of the object is also related to the velocity of the object through the derivative. We learned that if I take the derivative with respect to time of the x component of the velocity, I get the x component of acceleration, right? So this can also be rewritten as the integral of mass times dvx dt dx. The next thing that we can do, we're going from this line down to here, is say that, um, and I guess, let's erase this. This is all still equal to the work done. Oh no, there we go. Work done right here. So this is going to be, another way we could write this would be the integral of the mass. And now what I wanna do is I wanna kinda interchange these two guys so that instead of it being, no, not those two, my bad. I wanna interchange these two here. So I wanna write it as dx dt That shouldn't change anything um, in the system. And then we look at this term right here. What's this equal to? What's that equal to? Yep, this is velocity. X is the position of the object. If we take the time rate of change of the position, this gives us the X component of the velocity. So now our equation becomes integral M dx dvx. And now this is an integral we can do because it's the integral with respect to the velocity. And we've got the velocity right here. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna integrate from some V1 up to some V2. And this integral is going to become 1 half mass times the x component of the velocity squared from the values of v1 up to v2, right? Because it's just, if the mass is constant at least, v dv is just going to be v squared over 2. So finally, what we end up getting then is that the work done ends up being equal to 1 half mass times uh, v2 squared minus 1 half mass times v1 squared. And we're going to say let 1 half mv squared be defined as kinetic energy. So the symbol we're going to use for this is just a capital K. If we do that, then the work done here is equal to the kinetic energy whenever the velocity is v2 minus the kinetic energy whenever the velocity is v1. And another way to write that is just the change in kinetic energy for the object. So this expression, which is that work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy of the system or the object, this is often referred to as the work 
energy theorem or just the work kinetic energy theorem. And we can use it to solve problems. And that's what we'll do when we come back. You guys have any questions before we take a break? All right, I'm gonna stop this uh, recording and then um, we'll start again in 10 minutes. So we'll start again at like six, actually let's start at seven or five. Let's take a 14 minute break.